Welcome to the program. I'm Dedi in Abu Ghaida. Two main stories have gripped the world recently, making headlines. Firstly, Israel's deadly raid on a Gaza aid flotilla earlier this month. Most recently, Israel has said it will launch its own investigations into the raid. That's after rejecting a UN proposal for an international probe into the attack. And on the other side of the Atlantic, deep water trouble. It's been more than a month since the explosion and sinking of an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. But oil continues to gush into the sea with little sign of abating. Tonight, we put both topics under the microscope. For a first-hand account of the raid on the Gaza flotilla, we'll be joined by Gulf News reporter Abbas Al-Lawati, who was aboard the lead ship of the flotilla, the Mavi Marmara, at the time of the Israeli attack. And giving us his perspective on the BP oil spill is the CEO of Stevens Supply and oil expert, Bobby Stevens. He'll join us a little later on in the program. So, first to the Gaza flotilla. They had hoped to deliver aid and draw attention to Israel's three-year blockade on the Strip, but the attempt ended in tragedy and an international outcry. In the early hours of May 31st, Israeli armed forces stormed the lead ship of a Gaza-bound flotilla, killing nine people and injuring dozens. The vessel, Mavi Marmara, was still in international waters at the time of the attack. For a first-hand account of the raid, Gulf News reporter aboard the Mavi Marmara, Abbas Alawati, is with us on the program. Abbas, good to have you back. Good to be here, Larry. Uh, let me first uh, start by asking you about your thoughts on Israel saying that it's going to conduct its own investigation into the raid rather than uh, complying with an international investigation. Well, I mean, we've seen Israel conducting its own uh, uh, investigations in the past. Uh, I'm thinking of the recent Gaza war, and they have been very, very, they seem to have been very out of sync with what interna the international community has done. Uh, and I'm comparing that to the Goldstone report. So in terms of credibility, I'm not sure how far that will go. I think it's more lip service. Let me just also ask you first about uh, Israeli Defense Minister Ahud Barak saying that um, they might uh, ease the blockade on Gaza after, this, uh, after what happened with the uh, ship. So do you think that the international community would, will settle for just an easing of the blockade, seeing that there's really been a diplomatic fallout after this whole event? Well, you have to keep in mind the situation has been pretty stagnant for a while. So I don't see how much the international community can do now. Um, I've argued that this, is, this was a civil society uh, endeavor. And it seems like in this conflict and with the situation of Gaza, it seems that the civil society is only the only thing that can actually move uh, something like this, non-governmental organizations. Um, I think hand in hand, maybe they can do something, but I, I doubt we can put much in the hands of uh, governments to do because they haven't done so for the past three years. Um, whether this will do something, maybe, I mean, like I said, you know, you c maybe civil society can do it alone, but they need to uh, sort of bring attention to it as they have done with the flotilla. Uh, Abbas, what do you make of, uh, right after the attack, uh, Israel claimed that there were terrorists on board. Mm. Um, what do you make of those claims? You were on the, uh, on the Mavi Marmara. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, they're pretty far-fetched. Uh, the, they claimed What was your screening process like? Uh, was it pretty rigorous? So yes, where did I mean, you board the ship from? Uh, from we, we boarded it from, from Antalya. Uh, we went through Turkish customs the way that anyone would. And you know, a lot in Israel, a lot of people in Israel have said that you know, why should we tr trust Turkish customs? We, why can't they be monitored in our own ports? But the thing is, I mean, there are ties between Turkey and Israel. There are flights that go there. I mean, you trust Turkish tur customs otherwise. Ev and every every time there's anything that goes between those two countries, why is this case different? Uh, we went through Turkish customs, and uh, they seem pretty vigorous. We went through a full pas passport control process, um, metal detectors, everything. You know, the whole. The so, path. was there any point at sea when anyone? Um, could have boarded these ships. Well, we had people boarding, uh, but uh, because one of the sh w w two of the other ships had uh, sort of failed, um, and we had people coming through from those ships. Uh, but those, I mean, those ships had come out of ter uh, out of Greece, and they had been checked at those ports. And how many ships left together? Uh, we were supposed to be nine. We ended up being six. Yeah, because uh, two had faced faults, which we, which a lot of people believe uh, were the cause of because of sabotage, which people are p blaming Israel for. 
Let's talk about the confrontation itself mm -hmm. uh, when the Israeli military actually attacked these ships and boarded these ships. How did the confrontation begin? Was there any warning? Did you receive any warning being See, on the ships? Um, th I mean, I can tell you two things. A, what I saw, and B, what I, the, the eyewitness accounts that I gathered. I mean, when I was in prison uh, for a short while, I just, I just tried to gather as much information as I could. Now, from what I saw, uh, I was on the deck for a very short time. Uh, when I saw p p injured people coming in, I thought it's getting too dangerous. They're shooting at everybody or anybody. And I came in to just to sort of film the Israeli captive soldiers. Um, so no, I haven't heard of anything, any such thing. But I have been speaking to organizers and I came back to the Bay and I confirmed again. And I was told that there ha was absolutely no warning from the Israeli Navy. Well, the only communication we had with them was on the Mavi Marmara was um, identify yourself and where you're heading. And the captain said, we're heading to Gaza. As far as I'm told, uh, and I've confirmed this, um, we, there was absolutely no communication after that. Now, according to international norms, even if they have to attack, if they were, are going to attack, they're supposed to give us an ultimatum, a warning. Uh, they're supposed to say, change your course, or we will have to intercept you, or intercept your ship. That, as far as I know, has not happened. Israel has released some kind of footage, uh, some kind of audio, uh, saying that we, ha we had communicated with them. It has retracted some of that, said, oh, sorry, that wasn't the Mavi Marmara, there was another ship. So the information coming out of Israel, while it's important to keep an eye on that, the, the, its credibility is almost nil. Uh, y there, there have been official retractions. So I wouldn't really concentrate on that much. I would, I would seriously concentrate on getting accounts from people who are on board. Um, I, like, like I said, I've spoken to people and they have said there was absolutely no warning. I could be wrong. I think maybe we need to check with more people just to confirm, but that's as what I know so far. Well, you're absolutely right in getting accounts, um, needing uh, to get accounts from people on board, and uh, we have a lot more to talk to you mm. uh, about. Uh, so Abbas uh, Lawati will stay with us. We're just going to take a short break here on Dubai Tonight. We'll be back. Do stay tuned. You're watching Dubai Tonight, and I'm joined once again by Gulf News reporter Abbas Alawati, who was aboard the lead ship of the Gaza-bound aid flotilla, the Mavi Marmara, at the time of the Israeli attack that took place earlier this month. Abbas, so just before the break, we touched upon you know, the initial confrontation. Um, you came back to Dubai, and you wrote a piece in the newspaper that you work for, Gulf News, and you said in it that you felt a sense of uh, euphoria upon realizing how big a news story this would be but then had a sense of reality and realized that events on the boat had taken a horrible turn. So when you realized that events had taken a turn, what initially went through your minds? What were you thinking? I was thinking this is not what I expected. I mean, we were trying to, I was trying to board what, I, what appeared to be a peaceful ship uh, to Gaza. Uh, and, and it seemed that the Israelis had started to fire live ammunition, um, based on which everything just unfolded the way it does. Like captive Israeli soldiers, that kind of thing. I thought that it was very dangerous for us to keep or hurt uh, Israeli soldiers. Uh, you know, like I mentioned in the piece, we have heard, I mean, there's Israel, the, Israel's last two wars were fought uh, on captive Israeli soldiers. They've killed over 1,300 people for both. I didn't think they'd hesitate for a second to bomb us uh, completely. Um, no, but, the, but that's, that's, I mean, initially I thought it was, it was a great story. I mean, I had, I was filming a captive Israeli soldier. You don't get that kind of thing every day. Of course, that footage is gone. Uh, but um, what was the mood right then on the boat? Uh, what were people doing? How were they reacting? H how were you feeling? There was a lot of confusion because I mean I just looked back and I see a soldier crying and uh, you know because a lot of people had sort of psychologically prepared themselves for everything including being detained in Israel but I think nobody had expected to see blood or a captive Israeli soldier. There was a lot of confusion as to what what's to be done. The, obviously there were I mean there are people who had seen these soldiers apparently uh, shoot and kill people so there was a lot of anger. Uh, very quickly some of the organizers came they just shooed them away and, s and started you know uh, giving them medical attention. Uh, some were, there, there was only one that I saw that was bleeding, the, other, the others didn't have any surface wounds that I saw. Um, but no, I mean, I think they, they probably made a very good decision in, um, in terms of even a, the PR war. Uh, you know, some of these pictures have, sh I mean, the video I had, the video footage I had that Israel confiscated, it did show the medics attending to these people. Um, the organizers always made it clear that our m mission is peaceful. Now, this is a boat of 700 people. You probably are bound, you are going to find someone who's going to get angry and maybe try to hit someone. 
but as far as I know, the organizers were very, very um, careful to you know portray themselves to be um, completely a peaceful mission and. Uh, and by then, how long was it from the time that the Israelis uh, came aboard the Mavi Marmara and then transferred and seized you all, uh, mm. I should say, to the port of Ashdod? Um, what happened was, uh, I mean, we weren't too far from uh, Ashdod. Uh, it, we were about, I think, about a hundred, no, sorry, 74 miles exactly, when uh, nautical miles, when we were intercepted. Um, that's not too far. Um, but w they, they approached us at around 4.30 a.m. And by the time we disembarked, it was around 11 a.m. So we'd been in handcuffs from what, say, 9 a.m. to sorry, I said I had said 11 a.m. I meant 11 p.m. So we're in handcuffs from like 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. and that's when we're, we disembarked and started uh, all the procedures with the Interior Ministry, the interrogation, or, or the questioning, uh, if you like. Well, I want to ask you about that. How were you and your colleagues then treated by the Israeli authorities? Um, to our surprise, uh, after hours and hours of of quite harsh treatment from the Israeli army. Harsh uh, treatment such as? Well, I had a gun pointed at me at, at, at for, for a long time uh, I, because there was a soldier that just happened to be standing right behind me. Every time I talked to someone, you know, at one point he's this, just, you know, sort of hit my shoulder with a gun. He's like, shut up. What that does that do to your psyche, Ambas, as a journalist? Uh, to be honest, I mean, I'm not trying to, but I mean, it really didn't, I mean, I, I didn't think he was going to shoot me. He was just trying to intimidate me. You could see a lot of panic in their eyes, too. I don't think they expected things to turn out that way. Uh, but they were expressionless. I mean, they were all wearing masks. The only thing you could see from them was their eyes. You went um, with this mission, obviously, as a journalist, um, delivering aid to uh, the Gaza Strip. Uh, have you heard of any signs of this aid getting through to the Gaza Strip? Not that I know of yet, because everything was on the ships, and I hear that the ships will be, well, the Israelis initially said that all the aid will be delivered to Gaza, um, but I also heard someone say that some of the ships will be sent back to Turkey. So I don't know about that yet. I mean, I've, I've just got back, so I haven't really uh, had a chance to update myself. I mean, I've, there's so much news coming in every second, so that I'm, I'm not too sure of. And what, in your opinion, or has this mission um, helped in any way uh, towards uh, breaking the siege on Gaza? Yeah, um, I was talking to one of the, I was interviewing one of the organizers before and she said, this is a historical turning point. I was like, you mean on the siege, uh, on the Gaza siege? She said, no, for the Israeli-Palestinine conflict. Now, I can, I, it was a little difficult to see that before, but I can sort of understand because, again, like I was saying, it's civil society showing what it can do. Uh, you had 700 people, unarmed civilians, aid workers, who sort of defied Israel's siege. Now, everybody was saying, would, they, would anyone do it again? And the Rachel Corey, of course, went through. And I think there'll be many, many more coming. Uh, so I think eventually, I think this probably was the tipping point. If, if I think Gaza, the break, breaking of Gaza siege is a matter of when and not if now. Uh, and I think eventually it's going to go. And I think we, if you look back, everybody will probably agree that this was what has turned, uh, what was the tipping point for that. And if you look back, for you personally, Abbas, what's the most thing that sticks out if you're, um, in your mind from this whole experience? This, the image I remember, there are two images I remember very well, is the, the captive Israeli soldier. I mean, the f I will never forget the, the fear in his eyes, because we're always told about the mighty Israeli army, that kind of thing. But I think when you separate them, when the, the individuals are still, still individuals, and he was terrified he was petrified I rem I'll remember that and then the first sight of injured people being taken because the, the first face I saw was unrecognizable because of how much blood there was that is definitely the sight that's going to stick for a while well Abbas we're very glad to have you back uh, safe and sound thank you nice to talk to you and a very interesting story thank you very much for sharing it with thanks us thanks for having me Oil flow decreases, but anger is on the rise. The latest on the BP oil spill disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. That's coming up next. Stay tuned. people for. Uh, but the one thing I'm absolutely confident about is that, uh, as we have before, we will get through this crisis. That was U.S. President Barack Obama on the BP oil spill still gushing into the Gulf of Mexico. You're watching Dubai tonight and we're changing track now 
From politics to the environment, the Gulf of Mexico has felt the media's glare for more than a month. That as BP struggles to contain the largest oil spill in U.S. history. It's killed 11 workers, is damaging coastal areas and wildlife, and costing the economy billions of dollars in losses. Now, U.S. Coast Guards also say that efforts to clean up the oil are becoming more complicated as the massive slick uh, breaks up into thousands of patches going in different directions and oil plumes settle underwater. The oil slick is closing in on the U.S. coast from Louisiana to Florida where businesses should be preparing to greet a flood of tourists at this time of year. Instead, they're getting ready to deal with waves of oil. Let's bring in oil expert and CEO of Stevens Supply International, Bobby Stevens. Uh, welcome to the program, Bobby. Thank you for having me. Let me first ask you about um, the cap that's now been placed on this oil leak. Um, it took a really long time to place this cap. First of all, why did it take such a long time? This was always an attractive option, but uh, when the event first occurred and the rig first sank, uh, the riser, uh, which is a pipe that uh, goes from the, s the seabed to the bottom of the rig, which is sitting on the floor, collapsed and much like a garden hose kinks or, or crimps, was actually reducing the amount of oil that was being released. Uh, the, the downside or the challenge of that was it was leaking in multiple locations. So uh, the debate and, and the, uh, the challenge there was to try to contain it without actually making the problem uh, more severe, which is what you would do by cutting the riser, which is what they've done. They are recovering more oil, but it's coming a trade-off. Well, okay, they are recovering more oil, but the leak still hasn't stopped. Now they want to change the cap next month, that is, in July. So why is there such a long wait? Well, this is unprecedented. And this is unprecedented what they're confronted with. And these are engineering challenges that uh, can only be compared to the space program. Uh, Initially, uh, the first device that they put in place, uh, which they positioned over one of the leaks on the riser, they referred to it as a top hat. Uh, it proved to be too large. Uh, the reason being at those depths, they're in 5,000 feet of water, so it's, it's extremely cold there. You're producing oil and natural gas simultaneously. And the size or the volume of the first device that they lowered proved to be so large that it allowed the uh, gas to actually crystallize an ice to form. So this prevented it from rising to the surface uh, t through the piping system they had in place to be uh, captured at the surface. There's talk of relief wells, Bobby. Um, is the solution uh, relief It's wells? the only true and real solution and this would have been done irregardless of any success that they would have had. Any of these other attempts that have been made uh, since the event have been just stopgap or temporary measures until a relief well could be drilled and uh, this is the only sure way to put an end to it. You know, Bobby, it's quite frightening that with all the technology that we have nowadays that they're still not able to contain this oil leak. Um, what will happen to all of the oil in the water that's currently in the water? Is it all going to wash ashore, further damaging the coastal areas and you know, robbing fishermen off their sources of income? Well, that's what's going on at the moment, and not all of it. And, and you know, an oceanographer would be the, the person to speak to about that. But it's all about the current. Uh, obviously, it's continuing on. Uh, there's unconfirmed reports that there are some massive plumes uh, that are being uh, obviously directed by the current. So, uh, actually, they've been very fortunate in the amount of oil that has come on shore, considering the magnitude and the volume of that has been released. It's still there. Uh, is there concern over hurricane season? It's being talked about and we're fast approaching that, uh, what, uh, what the hurricane season would do if you had an event like uh, the one that we just went through. Uh, it, it would be catastrophic when you consider the amount of water that was uh, brought into New Orleans and the tidal surge that was brought in along the Mississippi coast. Uh, it was bad enough and it's on, but if, if you mix a few million barrels of oil in that, uh, then you've really got trouble. Uh, in addition to that, obviously all, uh, all operations as far as the relief well and any others would have to cease. Uh, they wouldn't be able to drill or operate in, in those conditions. So it is a concern, uh, but I'm confident that it'll be brought to closure before that. Bobby, there's a lot of anger, uh, to say the least, towards BP. Of course, uh, you know, 
from President Barack Obama as well. Um, why is BP still in charge of the cleanup of this when they created the mess to begin with? Well, you know, uh, you don't want to single anyone out. BP was the operator. It was their well, and, and it did happen on their watch. But again, you have to appreciate the the challenges that are incurred when you're drilling in, in these environments. Uh, this is a cutting edge of technology in the drilling industry. Um, we've been drilling on land since the late 1800s, uh, but deep water really came of age in the 1990s. The first uh, deep water well was drilled in 1966, and it was very sporadic after that. But there's been a big push since that time. It's very, uh, very common now, and it's the most promising aspect of the industry. As far as why BP, why are they still in charge? Uh, in all honesty, they're doing everything that can be done. Uh, the best minds in the business are working on this. What will the industry learn from this in terms of um, drilling, deep water drilling offshore? Well, it'll we take We see a President Barack Obama even saying that uh, we need to move away from our dependence on fossil fuels. Well, that's always been uh, that's always been a concern. The, the United States consumes a quarter of all the oil produced in the world every day. Uh, they only produce about five million barrels a day, yet they consume in excess of 20. So, uh, the states is heavily dependent on foreign imports. Uh, this has been a concern uh, for a number of years, not only with the Democrats led by uh, Mr. Obama, but the Republicans as well. Uh, the only difference is they have two different strategies as how we should uh, reduce that dependency. Uh, if you followed the U.S. Uh, presidential elections uh, this last time, the Republican, uh, their war cry was drill, baby, drill. Uh, their, uh, uh, their answer to weaning us from this dependency is to exploit and use the reserves that we have at home, and the Gulf of Mexico is one of the most promising areas there. There are massive uh, reserves there that have been unchecked. Well, Obama is also using this, um, I guess, to push his policy on alternative energy. He has right? been an I mean, advocate. We see the UAE is a, quite a leader in that. In absolutely, he's energies. been an advocate of this from the from the beginning. Uh, he was elected. Uh, this was part of his platform when he was elected. He has always promoted alternate fuel sources, renewable sources, clean fuel, and and he has wanted to distance ourselves from fossil fuels as a primary fuel source. Uh, having said that, uh, he did, and they, uh, the Democrats do realize that that does not happen overnight. Uh, so they did leave the, uh, the drilling programs and the government regulation that was in place when he took office. Um, he is under an extreme amount of pressure at home to do something, or at least uh, give the impression that he's in charge of doing something, but the fact of the matter is, uh, the oil and gas industry is the only people capable of dealing with it. The U.S. government, they don't have the uh, expertise, uh, they don't have the equipment, nor does anyone else. It has to be dealt with by the oil and gas industry. What is the role, uh, or has there been a role that uh, countries around the Gulf have played in aiding uh, the oil spill disaster over in the U.S.? And let me ask you as well, could this happen in our region? This could happen anywhere. Uh, this is not a situation that's unique to the Gulf of Mexico. This has happened in the past. Uh, this is not a common occurrence, but it's not unheard of. Uh, recently, within the last uh, year, we had an event, something similar to this, in Australia. Uh, it didn't make uh, much, uh, or didn't get as much press as this has. There was no loss of life. Uh, the uh, I'm sorry, the environmental impact was, was minimal, so you didn't hear that much about it. Um, if you go back to 1979, uh, Pemex, which is the uh, Mexican national oil company, they encountered the same problem off the coast of Mexico. Uh, and this went unchecked for 10 months. Uh, at that time, it was due to a lack of technology to properly deal with it. So technology's advanced uh, significantly since then. Uh, and we're very confident and hopeful that this will not drag on for that long. Will we see any changes in terms of the technology used here and the drilling in the GCC after seeing what's happened over in the Gulf of Mexico? Well, you know, there's not. Uh, the, again, this is all about deep water. This is what complicates this so much. They're in 5,000 feet of water. If you would have had the same scenario play out on land or even in, in shallow water, uh, it would have been much easier to deal with. So there's not a lot, if any, deep water activity here in the, in the Gulf. Um, lessons will be learned that will apply to the industry 
for sure. Uh, but uh, as far as application or, or the uh, operation that was under place there, not directly, but a lot will be learned from this. All right, Bobby Stevens, thank you very much for your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Email us with your comments and suggestions at Dubai Tonight at dmi.ae plus see our shows anytime online at dubai1.ae and follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash Dubai Tonight. Join me again next time, but for now, goodbye.